Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a situation. News to hand, a 6.4 Richter earthquake on the sea floor in the southern Gulf of Papua has sent a tsunami westwards across the Torres Strait, inundating the archipelago with extensive casualties and homeless. Moreover, the paramilitary Kualmag Free Occupied Australia Front for Liberation, or the Kafofel, <laughs> which has long claimed the continent of Australia as its sovereign territory, has exploited the disaster to land scores of armed units on Cape York Peninsula to initiate its long declared conquest of Australia. The Australian Defence Force is to support Australian civilian authorities in delivering humanitarian and disaster relief while neutralising the kerfuffle threat. You, sir, are the Chief of the Australian Defence Force, the CADF, a simpler acronym, and alongside you have your immediate three-star subordinates, your Joint Operations Chief, or the JOPSCA, your Army Chief, sitting somewhere towards the back, congratulations on the promotion, your Air Force Chief, your Navy Chief. As well, you have your Operational Support Chief who oversees your Logistics Command and Intelligence Units. But this is not just a military problem. There's a humanitarian crisis and law and order that needs to be established on domestic territory. Therefore, you also need to work with OzAssist, who will coordinate the non-government organisations delivering aid, as well as the FOSPOL the Federal Australian Police, who will maintain law and order. This is your organisation. You, with your subordinates and their various subordinates, a team of some 20 to 25 people, each with very different responsibilities, each with different decision-making styles and personalities, each with starkly different organisational cultures, and yet somehow you must work together to efficiently and effectively respond to this crisis. Should you, as the chief, micromanage all of these people to launch this operation, or sit back in the pyramid here and let everybody do their, their business? Is there another way? How can this mass effort be effectively coordinated? Enter the humble firefly for tourist lucicrescence. A tiny little creature, if you've ever had the fortune to see it in the forests of North America or Germany, that can emit a pulse of light, winking on and off through the biology of its own internal structure. Now, each firefly of itself will prefer to oscillate through its off and on states according to a frequency um, that's part of its own internal makeup, its particular species. But fireflies have the remarkable ability that when put in a swarm with other fireflies, a very strange phenomena takes place. Now, unfortunately, I don't have a video of actual fly, fly, fireflies to show you, so rather I'm going to show you a computer model of this phenomenon. So the firefly will observe the other fireflies and each cycle will ever so slightly adjust its, the timing of its pulse so as to match its pulse as close as possible with that of the other fireflies within its visible horizon. Now this local synchronisation, if the density of the swarm and the number in the swarm is large enough, can effectively propagate across the entire swarm until, quite beautifully and remarkably, within a small matter of time, the whole swarm is winking on and off in unison. The pulsing is synchronised. Moreover, this is achieved without there being a single master controller orchestrating this remarkable activity. In complex systems world, we would describe the whole as now being more than just the sum of its parts. So the question for us is, is there something in this phenomena that can handle, that can help you, Chief, in your hour of crisis? Well, clearly there are a number of differences between our very responsible human beings and the humble firefly. For one, um, our people don't just float in the middle of the air. 
they're connected to each other in various ways. For example, through the organisations within which they work, along the various sites around the defence precinct or around the capital city where they conduct their daily business, but also through the fact that many of these people have actually worked together in other different positions as they've gradually worked their way up the rank structures to assume the responsibilities that they, they now hold. Therefore, it's straightforward to say whether they like it or not that they are not a hierarchy as you see here, but form very much a network. Now, it's quite cheap to say it nowadays, but networks are ubiquitous in our lives. Whether you're on Facebook or Twitter, frankly, I'm too busy, or just link together through good old-fashioned email, we are connected to each other across diverse lines in our business, our cultural, and in our private lives. So what role does the connectivity of the network play in the ability to synchronise activity? To help illustrate this, I'd like to show you, again, a computer model. This is courtesy of my colleague in Joint Operations Division, Dr Tony Decker. So we're dialling up a network now of a relatively large number of nodes. Each node now is not winking on and off, but rather cycling through a sequence of colours from red to orange, yellow, green, blue, purple and back to red. Synchronisation is now the phenomenon that over time every node in the network starts to cycle through its sequence of colours in the same way at the same time as every other node in the network. We can measure the success of this network synchronisation through a little graph and when the red line reaches the value 1 and stays there, then we can say that the network has quite effectively synchronised itself. Once again, we have a phenomenon that is not orchestrated by a central master controller, but is achieved through the mutual interactions of every node in this network with each other. It's again a case of the whole being now more than just the sum of its parts. Now the mathematical models underlying this is, to my liking, elegantly simple, bringing together a very small number of elements. One, the connectivity between the nodes in the network. Secondly, given a connection, how strong is that link? In other words, how quickly does a change in one propagate through to a change in the other? And finally, what is the diversity across all of the nodes of the speed with which each one, if left to itself, would prefer to cycle through its colours? Everyone is not the same in this network. And yet, despite this diversity, the connectivity is enough to enable the network to synchronise. Now, of course, there's many more differences between our fireflies, our little synchronising nodes on a network, and the people that have to answer this serious crisis on our shores. For one, they're not just cycling through a sequence of colours. They're making very difficult decisions about how to responsibly use very powerful means that are available to a military force. Secondly, the situation with the humanitarian crisis and an invasion of our shores is happening in real time. They don't have the luxury to sit back in their offices, formulate the most elegant plan and then launch it when they're good and ready. They need to start taking actions immediately and then adjusting the plan on the fly. Now the military are very familiar with this idea and they have a very simple and one might say rather cute name for this. They call it the OODA loop. So this cyclic decision making, adjusting on the fly as the environment change is a repetition of observation, taking in what's happening in the external world, orientation, comprehending the situation, and then projecting forward with courses of action and then deciding on that course of action that they want to go with. Finally, acting out into that world. 
Now, of course, the world will react back and they therefore need to observe that reaction and go back through the process all over again. The innovation that some of us in Joint Operations Division have dared to make, have had the audacity to make, is to propose that this connected UDA looping of important military and civilian decision makers can possibly be represented by a mathematical model of nodes on a network cycling through whatever continuous change of state um, that might be relevant to them. Of course, there's more differences between our fireflies and our important people. And it's kind of buried in what I just said, that in the middle of this OODA loop, they are using something that a firefly does not have, and that is a very powerful brain that is able to comprehend a very complex situation and, for the most part, make very good decisions. Now, just to help you understand what we are not doing in our research, we are not trying to make an individual, that unique, precious, irreplaceable individual, a better orienter on, in the situation and a better decision maker, given their intellectual capabilities. This is certainly the job for psychologists and it's excellent research, research that we seek to build on in our research. Rather, we are asking a quite different question and that is, what happens if you place the individual in a system such that the system is enabling that very expert individual to work with other experts in the system and achieve coordinated decision making. So our research is all about how to make the system work for you and not against you so that your intellectual capabilities can be addressing the problem at hand and not how to make the system work for you. So, is a hierarchy the best way to do this? I think most of you will know that that's not the case and I can assure you the military know this very well as well. What about a small world network where every individual is separated from another by at most six degrees of separation? Will this enable our network of people to more effectively coordinate their activity? Well, let's try it. Now, in these models, I'm randomly assigning the ability of individuals to cycle through their uh, decisions, and therefore I have no guarantee before I run this how the system will behave. So let's run it and see. Just to bring your attention to certain features in the diagram, the network, of course we have at its heart a central hub of tightly connected nodes in the network. Undoubtedly, that's our chief of the Australian Defence Force, his immediate subordinates and the most important people that he thinks need to be brought inside the tent. On the other hand, we've got an individual out here that seem to be poorly connected into the rest of the network. This might be our intelligence guy, the spook, who, given the classified nature of his or her information, needs to be rather more selective with whom they communicate. Well, how's the system going? Let's observe the red line. And certainly what we can see is um, not bad effort, pretty good, but you're not quite getting to one. There's certainly some more uh, coordination that could be achieved in this network and quite possibly we can imagine where we might put links into that network to enable it to work better. So where are we in our research? <clears throat> Certainly we have mathematical models that underlie the sorts of simulations that I've just shown you. I would like to say that thus far we've been able to validate these models and check them against real human behaviour. We are some distance from that. This is a small part of our effort. We do a lot of other things in our division um, and we haven't quite got that far. So I'd like to be able to put my hand on my heart and say, we can dial up the network to solve your problem, but we're not quite there yet. But we are nonetheless able 
to observe in our models interesting behaviours that we can recognise in the organisations that we work in around us. For example, have you ever been in, a net, in an organisation where one part of the organisation is always out of step with the other? Where somehow, no matter how much you broadcast information, you can't get that other group over there to be on the same page as you. The organisation is chasing its tail. Well, we can recognise exactly such behaviours in these models by looking for these kind of cyclic behaviours in our measure of success of network synchronisation. And moreover, we can now probe into the structure and identify those parts. And I can assure you that it's not about the fact that one individual is slow or a set of individuals are slow. They will make decisions the way they see appropriate. And the individual in this sort of work is unassailable. The issue is how they're connected into the rest of the network. And so we can propose changes that enable them to link in better and therefore get the whole organisation on the same page. In this research, for me, it's fascinating to be able to bring together beautiful, elegant mathematics on the one side and our best knowledge of how human beings work together in order to actually help human beings work together even better. We have a long way to go in this research, undoubtedly, and we hope that the organisation will support us to continue in these efforts. But now finally, back to you Chief, you have your mission, and hopefully now you've got a better idea, though I think having seen you in action now, I think you already know this, how to organise yourself and organise your people to confront the situation at hand. Let's learn from the fireflies and connect each other so that we can run with the power of self-synchronisation. Thank you.